Our Father, we thank you for the beginning this morning. We are praying, O oh Lord, that your Spirit will speak to our hearts. You will point us back to the old path. And we pray that as you point us to the place we ought to be, as individuals and as the body, as a church, we pray, O oh Lord, that you will help us to earnestly go to the place of fellowship with you, where your pure word will be what guide our, guides our lives all through the rest of our days in Jesus' name. Amen. Speak to us this morning. Give us attentive ears and willing hearts to obey everything you will reveal to us. And let this, Lord, be a foundation for all that you will do for us, even at this Congress, that the church in truth and reality may go back to the old time biblical revealed standard of yours help us lord in jesus name we pray we're looking at the message back to the old path in jeremiah chapter 6 we're reading from verse 13 through to verse 18 for from the least of them even unto the greatest of them. Everyone is given to covetousness. And from the prophet, even unto the priest, everyone dealeth falsely. They have healed also the heart of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed? When they had committed abomination, nay, they were not all ashamed. They were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. At the time that I visit them, they shall be cast down, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk therein, and ye shall find rest for your souls. But he said, we will not walk therein. Also, I set watchmen over you, saying, hearken to the sound of the trumpet, but he said, we will not hurt him. Therefore, hear, ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Here we have the description of the life of the people of Israel, the people of God, that at this particular time, when Jeremiah was called upon to speak to them, inviting them back to the old past, you can see from verse 13 to verse 15, the condition in which we find them. And these children of Israel are referred to as the church of the old dispensation. If you look at Acts chapter 8, Sorry, Acts chapter 7, verse 38. Acts 7, 38. It's not only to write references down, you ought to open the Bible and see what we're reading. Acts chapter 7, verse 38. This is he which was in the church in the wilderness. For the angel which spake to him in the Mount Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. These people are referred to as the church in the old dispensation. And they had what we'll call today spiritual experiences. And as a body together, 
These were people that the Lord delighted in because he had called them unto himself. But they became backsliding. They became reprobate. They became rebellious. They were obviously self-willed. They had gone astray. And the backsliding and apostasy had not only involved and affected the membership, the people that knew nothing of the call and the statutes and the law of God. But we're told from verse 13 that from the least of them, even to the greatest, everyone had, give, had given himself and herself to covetousness, which is idolatry too. And that from the prophet, even to the priest, everyone had gone astray, now dealing falsely. And their preachers were healing the hurt of the daughter of God's people slightly, saying, Peace, peace unto them in their backsliding, apostate condition, telling them there was peace when there was no peace. And now they were committing all kinds of abominations without feeling guilty, without feeling condemned. Their consciences were now seared with hot iron. That is why it says in verse 15, they were not ashamed when they committed abominations and they did not blush. They did not feel any guilt. And it says if they continued like that, they were going to fall by the sword. That God was going to visit them with judgment. And to make them avoid the judgment of God, God now called them. In verse 16, thus says the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths. And you ask, where are the old paths? Where is the good way? And having discovered the good way, walk therein. Only then will you find rest to your souls. Let's look at Israel of old and try to understand what they were. Then you will understand while the Lord was talking to them that they had gone astray out of the way. In the past, Israel was holiness unto the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord. And the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. Israel had been redeemed. Israel had been saved. Not just that they were taken out of the land of Egypt in the physical, but they also had an experience with the Lord that amounts to they are being saved or being redeemed and that they were holy before the Lord. In Exodus chapter 15, they rejoiced and celebrated their redemption and salvation. Exodus chapter 15, verse 13. Thou in thy mercy hast led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Unless you think that this was only salvation from affliction, salvation from the bondage in which they were, salvation or removal from the land of Egypt, lest you think that that is the only thing being referred to as redemption and salvation there. See the testimony concerning the children of Israel when he came out of Egypt. In Numbers chapter 23, verse 21, 
he has not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither has he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord is God, is with him, and a shout of a king is among them. You can see here that according to what we had read earlier in Jeremiah, they were holiness unto the Lord. Israel was holy. Israel was saved. Israel was redeemed. They were free at the time of their salvation and redemption. They were free from sin and iniquity. This was their spiritual experience. We are also told in the word that they were taught of God in the word of God. They were not just left alone, that they had been redeemed out of Egypt. They were also well taught in the word. Deuteronomy chapter 4. Deuteronomy chapter 4, reading from verse 4. But ye that did cleave unto the Lord your God are alive every one of you unto this day. Behold, I have taught you the statutes and the judgments even as the Lord my God has commanded me that ye should do so in the land whither ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations which shall hear all these statutes and say surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people these people had been taught the word the word of god the laws and the statutes of the lord and if you check up today what the church ought to possess one we ought to be saved in fact without being saved and redeemed you cannot be part of the church and these have been, have been our experience in the past that when people came to our meetings they know about the salvation of the lord they know that we must repent and pray seeking the face of the lord and be forgiven, be saved, have the witness of the Spirit within us that we're children of God. Thereafter, we told the people that they ought to make their ways right before the Lord, make restitution, cleanse their lives, so that the Lord will not see or behold iniquity in them. We were holiness unto the Lord. In all that we did, we were conscious of the holy standard of the word of God. And we were taught systematically the word of God. And we laid precept upon precept, line upon line. And we were also cleaving to the Lord in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials and tribulations. In the midst of the opposition within our communities, we were cleaving unto the Lord. Ye that, cle that did cleave unto the Lord, your God, are alive. Every one of you this day. That was the thing that made us to have real faith in the Lord. Because our consciences did not condemn us. When we looked at the word of God and when we looked at our lives, we knew that the Lord took delight in us. That was the condition of the children of Israel in the past, before the time of Jeremiah. And Moses said he had taught them the statutes and the judgments. Moses did not exalt the miracle ministry above the teaching ministry. From the time that God called Moses, God called him with a mighty powerful hand. And signs and wonders began to reveal themselves in his ministry. From the time he stepped on the land, the territory of Egypt, he began to demonstrate the miracle ministry. And as they went on in the wilderness, 
just as they were going out like this, they carried out an inspection, and there was not one feeble person among all their tribes. They were all healed, and they were kept well. They came to the uh, Red Sea, and it parted before them. Every step of the way, there was miracle. And yet, Moses said, I have taught you. In the early days of these children of Israel, they never exalted the miracle ministry or deliverance ministry or praying and fasting or getting blessings from above or seeking the way of faith to be able to get fulfillment of the promises of God fulfilled in their lives. They never exalted that above the teaching ministry. And if I can remind you the past experience of deeper life. The teaching ministry was the central ministry. We have always believed in healing. We have always seen people healed. We have always seen people delivered. We have always seen God fulfilling his promises. We have always known that the promises of God are yes and amen. For the people that love the Lord and depend upon him. We have always known that God is able to do all things. But at the early stage, even though we believed in miracles... We never exalted the miracle ministry above the teaching ministry. And so it was in Israel. The counseling that Moses did because his father-in-law came to him and he said, what is all this that you are doing? As the people lined up in the early days of, um, of the children of Israel, he said, I am counseling them. I'm not praying for them to get healed and get delivered. All the counseling I'm doing as these people are lining up, I am teaching them the precepts of the word of God. And I am showing them the way they ought to go. Then uh, the father-in-law said, why don't you appoint people? People that will look into matters, not into sickness, not into demonic oppression, not to attacks of evil spirits. People that will look into matters concerning one fellow to the other. And the little, little details, they will counsel them. They will teach them. They will guide them. They will show them the way. And then the difficult matters, they will take to you for counseling, for direction. All, whether it was public ministry or private ministry, whether it was the teaching ministry on the pulpit, or it was the counseling ministry in a private place, it was to emphasize the teaching of the word of God. They didn't, above, they didn't uh, place healing, miracle, above all the things that they were doing on the teaching of the word of God. If you look at a deeper life in the early years, we emphasize the teaching of the word of God. Publicly, whether it was a Monday or a Tuesday, whether it was a Thursday or Friday, whether it was Sunday or Saturday, a uh, workers' meeting, it was always, always the Word of God. Always the Word of God. Always teaching, line upon line, precept upon precept. And when it came to counseling, if you have been partakers of this benefit that we're talking about, in the early days, you will see that the counseling was not on healing. The counseling was not on deliverance. The counseling was not on all these, uh, you know, I had a dream, I had a problem, I have a vision, I have a prophecy, I have a, I have a revelation, I have a gift of the Spirit, I have this, I have that, I discern that Spirit, I have this sickness, something is crawling up all over my body. It wasn't that. Lady, there's nothing to laugh about. I'm not your boyfriend, I'm your preacher. So look at the Word of God and hear what I'm preaching. Now, when you, at the early years, you will see that it was the preaching of the word of God. It wasn't, uh, you know, heal me, lay hands on me, I want this, I want that, I want this other thing. It was just the word of God every time. And you see, over now, these years, when you look at the people that are lining up for counseling, it's no more the teaching ministry. It is no more the word of God that we are emphasizing. What people are now emphasizing is, I am sick. Something is crawling all over my body. Something is happening this way. My business is not going. In the early years, it was the teaching of the word of God. Now, you can see the children of Israel. They were exalting or lifting up. 
the miracle ministry now at the time of Jeremiah above the teaching ministry. All they were looking for now, deliver us from the Babylonians. Deliver us from all these judgments upon us. Deliver us from this and that. But in the past, it was not like that at all. And then, in the early years of the children of Israel, they dealt with sin. And they dealt with sin firmly, ruthlessly too. Let's look at Numbers chapter 15. Numbers chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 32. And while the children of Israel were in the wilderness, they found a man that gathered sticks upon the Sabbath day. And they that found him gathering sticks brought him unto Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation. And they put him in word because it was not declared what should be done to him. Here they found an offender. Now, these were the early years of the children of Israel. They were fresh out of the land of Egypt. And as God brought them out, they were mindful of the teaching of the word of God. They were not too mindful about increasing. They were not too mindful about their public image. They were not too mindful about their physical, numerical growth. All they were mindful about was keeping the standard that had been given unto them. And this fellow gathered sticks on the Sabbath day. And they didn't know at that, at that time what they ought to do. And therefore, first of all, even though they didn't know what to do, they removed him from the congregation of the children of Israel. And they put him in word, wanting to know what the Lord will tell them. Verse 35, And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. All the congregation shall stone him with stones without the camp. And all the congregation brought him without the camp and stoned him with stones. And he died as the Lord commanded Moses. Now there was discipline in their midst in their early years. But now at this time that I read to you in Jeremiah, when the priests themselves were living in sin, when the prophets themselves were living in sin, who is to discipline the offender? Who is to discipline the backslider? Who is to discipline the apostate? The one that has a reprobate mind and is going against the word of God. In the early years, there was discipline. But in the latter time, in the latter years of the children of Israel, they were now even rebelling and fighting with the preachers. The preachers couldn't tell them again about the judgment of God because they now felt that they would do whatever they wanted to do. In the early years, they were totally separate from the Gentiles in outlook, in relationship, in worship. In everything they did, they were completely separated from the Gentiles. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, from verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a chairman, or a consulter with familiar spirit, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Thou shalt be perfect. Well, the Lord thy God. Here was the injunction, the commandment of God for the children of Israel, and they kept to this in the early years. They were totally separate in their lifestyle. They were not involved with occultism. They were not involved with idol worship. They were not involved with the corruption of the land. They were not involved with 
all the things that you hear, you hear about or you read about later in the history of the children of Israel. We can say that about ourselves in the past. We are completely separate from all the unbelieving crowd, from all the Gentiles and all the denominational groups all around were separate. We were known as people that held on to a very high standard. But in the later years of these people, things changed. Look at Joshua chapter 24. Joshua chapter 24, reading from verse 31. Joshua 24, 31. And Israel served the Lord all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders that overlived Joshua, and which had known all the works of the Lord that he had done for Israel. These children of Israel were obedient, obedient unto the Lord. And uh, this is what we can say to you. In the early years of this church, we were obedient to the totality of the word of God. Old and young, new converts and old timers, the preachers that were called Bible study leaders at that time, and the, the leaders over the states that were called state leaders at that time, and we were all obedient to the word of God, we were very conscious of, were sensitive to the touch of the Spirit of God. In little things and minute things, we will be faithful to the obedience of the word of God. For the children of Israel, that's how they were in the early years. Very sensitive to the teaching of the word of God. And obedient to the totality, the entirety of the teaching of the word of God. But in their early years, they left the old path. They forsook the God-given distinctives that God had given to them. And Moses knew about it before he died. He knew that these people will not continue. And he taught them a song in prophecy that they were going eventually to deviate. And that when they deviated, they should remember this song that he will teach them after he had gone. And they will remember that they were walking in the righteous path of the Lord before. But now they had gone astray. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 32. Deuteronomy chapter 32 from verse 1. Give ear, O ye heavens, and I will speak and hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. My doctrine shall drop. As the rain, and my speech shall distill as the dew, as the small rain upon the tender herb, and as the showers upon the grass, because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe ye greatness unto our God. He is the rock, his work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. He first of all told them in preface form the past relationship of the children of Israel with the Almighty God. Now he began to look ahead and he began to utter prophetic utterances. Concerning their backsliding. Concerning the fact that they will go out of the way. Verse 5. They have corrupted themselves. Their sport is not the sport of his children. They are a perverse and crooked generation. Do ye thus requite, repay the Lord, O foolish people and unwise? Is not he thy father that has bought thee? Has he not made thee and established thee? Remember the days of old. Consider the years of many generations. Ask thy father, and he will show thee. Ask thy elders, and they will tell thee. Now he was preserving this prophetic 
word for them that in the later generation, the younger people that came, that will grow up as Israelites, they will deviate from the way of the Lord. And he told them that they will remember at that time the days of old. They will consider the years of many generations. And they will need to ask the elderly people in the commonwealth of Israel how things were. And as they asked, they will not be able to tell that they had gone astray, that they had not remained in the way of the Lord. Verse 15, but Jeshurun waxed fat and kept. Thou art waxing fat, thou art grown thick, thou art covered with fatness, then he forsook God, which made him, and lightly esteemed the rock of his salvation. He knew that these people will go astray. He knew that they will leave the old path and the old ancient landmarks. They're going to remove and they're going to shift. And he wrote this for them that after waxing fat and after growing thick, and after enjoying the provisions of the blessings of God, that they would have gone into their evil ways. Verse 16, they provoked him to jealousy with strange gods. With abominations provoked they him, they him to anger, the sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers Feared not. Of the rock that begat thee, thou art unmindful, and hast forgotten the God that formed thee. Moses was very clear about the fact that these people that had been saved, redeemed, the people that were well taught in the word, the people that dealt with sin, anywhere they found sin, the people that kept themselves separate from the Gentiles in the early days that are completely obedient to the word of the Lord, that they will eventually deviate and go astray and even get to the point of worshipping devils and idols. Let's look at Judges chapter 21 verses 24 and 25. Judges chapter 21 Verses 24 and 25, And the children of Israel departed thence at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family. And they went out from thence, every man to his inheritance. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. The backsliding had now begun. It says there was no king, but there were Levites. And actually the Levites were responsible for teaching them the way of the Lord. There was no king, yes, but there were priests. And the priests were responsible for reminding them of the law of their God. It says there was no king. What about the high priest? And these, the Levites and the priests and the high priests, were responsible for showing them the law of God, the way of God, the word of God. But because there was no king among them, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Apart from the fact that there were priests, there were Levites, and there were high priests, they still had the commandment of the Lord. When Moses went to be with the Lord, he didn't take the commandments away. And the commandments had been taught to everyone, and they were supposed to put it on their doorposts, they were supposed to hang it on their hands, they were supposed to make the laws frontlets uh, so that everybody will see. They were supposed to be teaching their own children every day as they walked on the road, as they were going to sleep, as they were waking up, sitting in the house or walking on the way. They were to be teaching the word of God. 
there was no reason for them to have abandoned the word of God. But they backslid. They forsook the way of the Lord. Now the same thing you can tell uh, among us. As we have grown fat and grown thick. As we have multiplied. And as the physical blessings of God have been upon us. There are people that have gone astray. Why? Is it because the word of God is no more available? Nay. We still have all the cassettes that we had listened, that we had uh, preached in our workers' retreats, in our leadership congress, and in our general retreats, and in all the meetings in the early years. A uh, few weeks now, I've been listening to some of the old messages to understand whether the fault is that we didn't teach everything that the people ought to know. Whether we didn't preserve for you the things that you ought to have known. And I've been listening to them and uh, in fact I felt that maybe the thing to do is not to come and repeat all these things but to bring the cassettes and to make you listen to them and to make you see what had been spoken about in the word of God. And you have the cassettes at home with you. You have the cassettes in the states with you. You have the cassettes in your fellowships with you. And you have the books. You have the tracts. And as you see all these things, you see that it is not the problem that there is no word, there is no doctrine, there is no teaching. It is not that we have not preserved the word of the Lord. It is just that the devil has taken over many lives, taken over many fellowships, taken over many pastors, taken over many overseers. It is because the devil has taken over that even though the Bible is there, the tracts are there, the cassettes are there, the literature is there, everything is there, we are not looking at them anymore. The people forsook the way of the Lord. Second Chronicles chapter 15. Verse 3, now for a long season, Israel hath been without the true God, and without a teaching priest, and without law. Can you imagine the descendants of Abraham? Can you imagine the descendants of Abraham that God revealed his name, Jehovah? He revealed that name to him. And he said he will bless him and make him a channel of blessing to other people. Can you imagine the people that were taught very clearly the word of God? And they were taught line upon line, precept upon precept. They had the law of God. It was preserved for them in the ark of the covenant. And the priests were appointed. And the Levites were appointed and placed in strategic places. There was good organization in Israel because they made sure that all the priests and all the Levites were evenly distributed to keep on teaching these people the way of the Lord. Isn't that what we have done in deeper life? Can any stage in this nation complain that because cassettes never get to us, because we, have ne we don't have any piece of literature, can any state complain in this nation, in deeper life, that because we do not have a state overseer, we do not have any district uh, pastor, that's why we don't know, and the way is so far from Lagos, that we cannot know the standard, and we were just doing the best we knew how, that is why there is no teaching on the true God. No, you cannot say that. Even though we have distributed the leaders and the preachers. And uh, once in a while, we call these people and we remind them. I remind them. Whether they are teachable is another question, but I teach them. The word of God and the things that ought to be the foundation and central involvement and emphasis in the church, in deeper life. And yet, what do we see? What do we observe? 
what do we look around as you look around and see the lives of people and you match the lives of the bible what do you see now for a long season israel had been without the true god israel and think about it egypt has no true god babylon no true god Assyria, no true God. The Midianites, no true God. The Philistines, no true God. This was the only nation that God revealed himself to, to make them a beacon, a beacon light, and to make them a mouthpiece, and to make them the people, his hand, his feet, that will take the knowledge of the truth to all the Gentile nations around. If they were without the true God, what will happen to the whole world? Think about deeper life. When God raised up this deeper life for a purpose. So that the light, the fullness of the light of the gospel will be in our midst. And then through this ministry, then we can begin to take the word, the light, the power of God. And the preaching of the entirety of the totality of the word of God to all the people around. Some of you are too young to know this. But we shall tell you. Because I've read it to you. It says, you young people, ask us who are your fathers. You young people, ask us who are your elders. What it was. The years of many generations. You ought to ask us and we ought to be telling you. Before this deeper life we're talking about, before we, before we started, all the fellowships around the major cities in this nation, they knew next to nothing on Christian dressing, on restitution, on sanctification. A lot of the gospel churches and the Pentecostal churches, you will see them and you'll be wondering what kind of groups they were. But by the grace of God, God raised up this church. And as we raised up, we began to, you know, spread our tents everywhere. Our retreats brought people all around. And people from those denominations, they will come. And they will catch the fire. And they took the flame back to their places. That's why you find that little by little, dressing started changing in all these churches. Am I right? That's why you find that some pastors and churches began even though they, are, they might not have got the full thing, they begin to talk about restitution. Eternal security was the main thing they were teaching them in almost all the churches. Pentecostal churches, evangelical churches, scripture union, almost everywhere. But as we began to emphasize the teaching of the word of God, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Eventually, some people that had been on eternal security, playing with sin, living in sin all the time, will begin to see a new change in them. And we begin to see that some of the people, before we started, polygamy was very common in evangelical churches. Polygamy was very common in many of the denominations. But as we began to emphasize it, emphasize it, emphasize it, emphasize the word of God, a lot of the people, they were now realizing that the teaching of the word of God is one man, one wife. What did the people know about rapture before tribulation? Before days, uh, church, deeper life, before we got up and started teaching. In many of the places, there were uh, people that will say, tribulation will come. I can tell you places in Imo State, places in Anambra State, places in a cross river all over and in the north as well where they were modeled up about eschatology about the teaching of the word of god that the rapture will take place after that the great tribulation and then after that and after that all the eschatological teachings people were ignorant but god raised up this church and we didn't do any other thing but teaching the word teaching the word teaching the word now if israel be without the true God. What's going to happen to these people? Some of those people, their fire is gone out. Their hope is that whenever Deeper Life is having something, a program for ministers, a program for general retreat, they will come and light 
their dead log of wood, light it in the fire again, and take the fire back to their nominations again. And they are pleading with us, and they are begging us, and they are saying, let the fire keep on burning. Let the fire keep on burning. So we can bring our sticks and woods, put it in your own fire, and then go back. They are asking for our literature. They are asking for our curses. But if we ourselves, we know our problem. The doctors are sick. The patients will be dying. The nurses themselves are fainting. We who are to heal the sick spiritually, we who are to take the fire to all these places, we ourselves, our wood is bringing out smoke without flame. How can we help them? And as they are giving us invitations, we are saying, hold your invitations to start with. We ourselves now, we don't know where we are going to begin. That our, our audiences, our congregations, our church buildings are littered with excreta. They are littered with corruption. They are littered with lying. They are littered with un exaggeration. They are littered with worldliness. They are littered with all these evil things that we ourselves too, we have our own problem now because we are without a teaching priest. Teaching priest. Teaching priest. The priest that will teach, these were the people that God appointed. I don't want to mention the name of the state overseer. A few years ago, I called him. I said, you are a teacher. Don't copy anybody. And don't go after all this miracle, vision, prophecy. I said, we need you. We need you. And he was my boy in the early years. Well, he still thinks he's my boy now, but obedience is what will tell us to make us know. Whether you are a Timothy, my son in the faith, that will be able to go back to wherever we place you. And these things that we have taught you, you know my lifestyle, Paul the Apostle said, and you know the teaching and the things that you have known among many witnesses. Go and confirm it to the people. He was my boy. And I had a lot of influence in his life. And because I'm a teacher myself, the influence I had on his life made him a real teacher. And I called him, I said, this uh, gives of the spirit, healing, deliverance, watching for witches and wizards. I said, be careful. You're a teacher. Don't lose this thing. We don't have a lot of you teaching people in the ministry. And the few of you that, we have, that can lay line upon line, precept upon precept, let's preserve you. Keep the teaching ministry. <laughs> well, a lot of people now have lost the teaching ministry. All they're looking for now is, you know, how to walk a miracle, how to make the blind eyes open, how to get a bread for the hungry, how to get money for the jobless, how to get prosperity for the poor, how to get this. And all these people are getting rich and they are denying the Lord and they are dying and going to hell. Let's have a teaching priest. Let's have the people that can teach the word of God and emphasize the teaching from the beginning to the very end. And then it says they were without law. You people, what have you done with the tracts that we gave you? Have you dis uh, do you still have them? Do you still have others me? I cannot. I don't think you have them. You don't know where they are. Because the way I see your life, for years you have not read that tract. I found it back. My lost tears. We gave it in your hand. What have you done with it? You sit in a toilet. Something that will take you to heaven. Something that will prepare you for the rapture. Something that will make you different from all the multitudes of this world. You've thrown it away. You are now without law. How about the teachings of the word of God? How about all the cassettes of this church? All you people. The cassettes of uh, the side road ministry. The ministries that don't last beyond a month. The ministries that don't last beyond a year. The ministries that don't last beyond this world. Because all they are emphasizing is uh, no restitution, no holiness. There is no teaching on sanctification. There is uh, nothing that will show that in your marital life, this is the standard of the family. Those are the cases you forget me. You abandon all the cases we put in your hand from the headquarters here. 
the teaching of the word of God that takes us years to be able to bring out of the word of God that has cost us our very life and blood. We put that in your hand, you relegate that one to the background. And the people that have never sweated, never consecrated, never placed themselves upon the altar of God, and all they are looking for, they are just looking for goody goodies in the Bible and joining this with this. Those are the cases you are all going about with. Now you have no law. Now you have no doctrine. Now you have nothing to make you establish. Now you do not have anything that will confirm the faith of the word in your heart of a long time. Israel now became a nation without the true God and without a teaching priest and without the law. These people had backslidden. They had gone away from the real thing that God had appointed for them. And now Jeremiah came to them eventually and said, Is this nation going to perish like this? Other nations have risen and fallen. Other nations have, you know, expanded and have gone down. And the same thing we can tell you. Other ministries and churches have risen and fallen. They have started and they have gone out of the way. Nobody knows about them today. They're only in the books of history now. And their children do not even know what happened or what heritage they had in the past. Are you going to make this deeper life like that? That you cannot continue in the word of God? That's why Jeremiah called them and he said, come back. Come back. We know what we were. We know what we are now. And we need to come back to where we were. Jeremiah chapter 6 verse 16. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Thus says the Lord. Stand. Stand ye in the ways. Stand ye in the ways. Take some time off activity. Stand. Stand in the ways. And see. And ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. Only then will you find rest to your souls. They were being called back to follow the ancient path. The old path. I've shown you their past stage. And their present state at the time Jeremiah was talking to them. And what they were being called unto. Let me just um, remind you, the past stage of deeper life. There was clear evidence of salvation experience. Very, very clear evidence. Because repentance majored in every message, at every Bible study, at every Thursday meeting or Friday meeting, at every workers meeting, every time, every retreat, repentance, restitution majored very significantly because of that many people were getting saved and it was it was very usual those days to see people crying and weeping because of their sin it was very usual a common thing those days to see people that in a workers uh, meeting or in a general retreat there'll be people they'll be praying and praying and praying it wasn't because of just giving altar call in the past, we're not used to telling people, raise up your hand if you want to get saved. In a whole year, we may not even do that in a whole stage. So for anybody to raise up his hand. Immediately we finished the meeting like this, there was no announcement after the meeting. There was no offering after the meeting. You find that many people now in some locations, they preach the word of God. And while they will delay the offering, they're looking for money more than the salvation of the people. After they have finished, uh, you know, the preaching and the people are praying. When they have prayed for two minutes or three minutes, they said, now, amen, amen. Then somebody will pray. Then they say, now, we're going to give our offering. Why didn't you give the offering earlier? Well, the people had not all come. But you started teaching the Bible when the people had not all come. So, you want them to miss the word of God. But you delay that offering time until when everybody has come. The love of money will destroy many churches. It will make you to forget and to forsake the way of the Lord. But 
there was real salvation experience in the earlier years. Then we were known for Christian conduct and holiness. Christian conduct and holiness. And I have never been ashamed of the holiness teaching. I have never been ashamed of the outlines and all the practical illustrations and examples we gave you. And you know that in the early years, we emphasized real holiness to the point that anywhere you are going, you are very conscious of the holiness standard, the holiness teaching of the Word of God. That's what we were in the past. There was freedom from worldliness in the past. Complete freedom from worldliness. All these, uh, you don't have uh, the ring in your ears now, but you have transferred it from your ears to your finger. What's the difference? You put it in the ear or you put it in the finger. What's the difference? Whatever name you call it, they call it a lot of names in the world. You call it engagement ring. Have you, we, we taught you that in the earlier years of deeper life. Or wedding ring. We taught you that one in the earlier years of deeper life. There was complete freedom from worldliness. Every kind, every form of worldliness. All the palming that you see now that some of these uh, people here are covering under their scarf. There was nothing to cover those days. All the television all the uh, Wadley magazine. Do you know that there are people now that will subscribe to Wadley magazine? The magazine that has all these bad, bad things in them. And they would say they, they are well informed. Well, we're only well informed about heaven in the early years. We're well informed about the kingdom of God. We're well informed about the coming of the Lord. And about the doctrines of the Bible. We were well informed. Now, you are well informed about the world, and you are not well informed concerning the things of the kingdom of God. And so, in the earlier years, we had evangelism as our lifestyle. Although we did evangelism every Saturday in Lagos here, and in many of the states, you did evangelism every Saturday, not one Saturday a month, every Saturday, every Saturday, we did evangelism. Not only that, in the bus, on the street, everywhere, evangelism was a lifestyle. But now, it's difficult to get people to even open their mouth and tell you that they are Christians. It's difficult for them to even give the testimony of salvation. It's difficult to, let, to say that all the people in the house fellowship, today we're going to go out, everybody will evangelize. If it's evangelism, you will not see uh, three quarters of the people you'll not even see up to one quarter now it means that we've lost what we had we had distinctive respected teaching ministry we had it everybody knew and all the various denominations they said if you're looking for teaching deeper life is the place recently we had uh, a program for our Igbo audience in Lagos. Because of our uh, decentralization plan uh, to give them churches of their own, we've earlier had the Yoruba program to give them churches of their own. Now this Igbo program we urge, Sunday evening we, uh, at 5 o'clock, when we concluded the program, we had more than 10,000 in Dutch, in, you know, at Bagada. And the testimonies and the message, everything was done in Igbo, direct, without anything being done in English. And uh, one of the testimonies that was given in that program, a particular woman wanted to see the way of the Lord, wanted to know the way of the Lord. And uh, he was going about, she didn't know where she would go. And she went to somebody in the celestial and said, I'm looking for where I'll be taught the word of God. I'm, I'm hungry. For the word of God. He said, uh, let me tell you, I go to Celestial. But I won't like you to come to where I am. The way you are talking, you are very serious. You are looking for something. You are looking for the Bible. There's only one place I know. I'm not their member. I don't go there. I'm still in my place. But go to deeper life. That if you really want to know the way you are talking, you want to know the Lord, 
you want to know the Bible, you want to live a life that, you know, you are not happy with the way you are living, you want people that will direct you, go to deeper life. That's the only place I can tell you to go. He himself was in that other place. The people knew us, that we had distinctive, respected teaching ministry. Our members were well taught. None of these denominations could confuse our members. And our members were consecrated with no love for money. No love for money. We rejected offers. We rejected scholarships. We rejected traveling abroad. We rejected a life, a kind of easy, compromising life. We rejected, if money was coming from a wrong source, we rejected it. If somebody sent offering into the church and we discover that this person is not living right, we take the money out of the offering so that the bad money will not uh, corrupt and destroy the good money there. We say, young man, you're still in your polygamy and you're still in your cultism. Get your check. Get your money. Deeper life cannot throw that into our own accounts. We cannot take that. That's what deeper life was. We didn't have any love of money. What do you see today? Our preachers are running after the rich people. We have neglected the poor people. The poor people cannot be counseled. The poor people cannot be taught. The poor people cannot uh, be given any program. What do we spend all our lives upon now? Rich people. Educated people. And those people... You see your calling brethren, not many mighty, not many noble, not many people that are worldly wise are called. If you all that strength you are putting on those rich people, and even after all you have spent 10 years now, or maybe 5 years following him up, going to his house, you remove your shoe before you get to his house, never did that for anybody in my life. If I want to preach the gospel to you, I'm the one that is in charge. I'm the one that has authority. You remove your shoe before you get to the house of the person you are going to talk to. All the villagers and all the poor people that are waiting to hear the word of God will neglect them. And will be running after people, yes sir, yes sir, yes sir, after a backslider and a sinner. Because he has car, because he has uh, money, because he has the things that is going to perish over the world. And they are coming to the church, and you put them, that one is an area leader. The fellow who has been in the church, before him, five years before him, who knows the Bible from cover to cover, who does his quiet time, who prays a lot, who knows God, who can touch heaven. We, they are not here today, all those people who know God, they are illiterates. We are not going to invite them to a place like this. But the people will say, I'm encouraging brother so and so. The one you are talking about is not a brother. Only ask money. Money doesn't make us brother. It is salvation that makes us a child of God. The people you are running after, eh, brother, eh, you are coming to the Congress. They are here now. If they will tell you the truth, they are not qualified to be here. If they will tell you the truth, they will tell you. They don't have quiet time. They don't read Bible. If they will tell you, a lot of these rich people that you are bringing, and you will be, you will be sad, the scripture teacher. What a pity. We have the people there that they know the Bible. Those, the real children of God. The people that if the rapture takes place now, the people that will get there before the pastor gets there. We leave all those people. Those ones are not here now. And then the ones that have Kobo and Naira, we pack them there. We say, you teach that side the scripture, you'll be coordinator, you'll be this. And be, they don't know head from tail. They don't know anything in the word of God. They all jumble everything, mobble everything together. Their testimonies are not even clear. And, uh, you know, it's all they exhibit is they are dressing a psychedelic a kind of thing. Their wives still have all the worldliness. The television is still there. Everything is still there. And we say, we'll be patient with them. Why well, are you not patient with those illiterate too? What's the matter with you? That you are not patient with the illiterates and the people that have no money is the people that have money that we're running after. Well, I said we because of, you know, the whole church. I'm not one of you because I don't run after those rich men. In Lagos here, our things are different. If you are rich and you love the Lord, we'll get you involved. If you are poor, you love the Lord, we'll get you involved. 
We have 66 districts now in Lagos. And we have Yoruba people who are in charge of every district for the Yoruba people, for their Yoruba audience. And all the 66, they should be here today. As we're inviting the people that know grammar, uh, Brother Labi there, can you just stand up? Uh, Brother Labi, the, yes, that's, that's one of our Yoruba people. You know, he's a Yoruba person. He's not, he didn't go to university, just, uh, you know, working on his own. And we make him, you know, one of the leaders. And I can point to, you know, all the people there. We're not, in Lagos, you can see that, Brother Labi. We're not, uh, you know, running after, you know, this one is educated, that one university. All these university people, do they believe the world? Are they not the people that are coming in and destroying the, the, put the thing we have been building for years? They put everything upside down. But give me these illiterates and, uh, you know, we have Igbo people now. We have 66 also of Igbo people, real Igbo indigenous, that, uh, you know, will be in charge of each of the districts as well in Igbo. Over here, everything is, as we're considering the English, we're considering the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Efik, the Edoman, and all the others. It is not just that we're running after this one has car. What are we going to do with car? Even if you have aeroplane, when the rapture takes place, are we going to take aeroplane there? You, you and your aeroplane will be here. And you'll still be in, you know, in the great tribulation. But we have destroyed this whole thing. The thing that we started well, that we didn't know car owner, we didn't know any rich man, we didn't know anybody. All that we knew is, if you love the Lord, you are my brother, you are my sister. Don't you remember early days of deeper life? If it's a sister that can preach the word of God, it's a sister that can really stand on the truth of the word of God, we make her the Bible study leader. If it's a brother that can do it, we put him as the Bible study leader. Whether man or woman, whether he's riding bicycle or not riding bicycle, we put them there and, oh, deeper life that time. Deeper life for those days. That was deeper life. And the name, deeper. Everybody knew that this one, that one was deeper. The one we have now is shallow. It's not, you know, if you, if you look at the beauty of the past, of the, of the past, the glory of the past temple, and you look at, you know, the artificial glory of this temple we are in now, there's such a great difference. When is this church going to go back to that old thing? When is this church going to go back to the time when our people in our marriages, we married within the fold? And it took us years, years, because even myself as your, as your leader, as your uh, Bible study leader or whatever you called me at that time, when did I get married? Wasn't I almost, almost becoming gray-headed before I got married? And did I go to get married in CAC? Did I go to Assemblies of God to find somebody? Did I go to all these side of the road ministries to get married? A lot of the people now, we see all their letters. They have found somebody. We don't know. Maybe they want, if we don't get, if we're not careful, they'll soon find people to get married in Celestial. They'll soon get people to get married to in, um, you know, in the uh, Children and Seraphim Church. Now they marry, uh, they marry now from Anglican, from, uh, you know, even getting Catholic, and now they, they will say, yeah, I've, I've seen that person, is a child of God, and uh, even though he's uh, the Catholic, is this and this, he's born again, marry them. Marry them. The trumpet will so sound. And you and the person you have married, you'll be telling them, but you will, you will tell the people at the Great Tribulation, when they don't allow you to buy or sell, without the mark of the Antichrist, when they begin to dribble you and the sorrow is much upon you, you will tell them, you will say, we had a faithful father. He told us. I know, you will say, I know why I'm here now, why I'm going this, undergoing this suffering because I didn't listen to the warning voice that told me. Now in the earlier years of deeper life, before we will accept that somebody in that other place is a Christian. You know how they used to abuse us? They say, deeper life does not ag agree that any other person is Christian. Am I right? But now, every dog, every pig, every dick and Harry, every Judas Iscariot, every Demas, and every person that has never known the Lord, every sorcerer, Simon the sorcerer, is now member. 
We now, we, you can get married anywhere now. Who, who taught you that? Didn't we teach you to pray and know the will of God before you get married? And all the things you are doing now, visiting one another, eating together, even at the time of courtship, is that how deeper life was? If you have been here for some time, you will know what we stood upon. And there was real uh, consecration. Real consecration, commitment to this salvation, sanctification, and Bible believing attitude that we had. We had the fear of God. The fear of God. You, you will see people in those days, uh, if you are, maybe you went to talk to somebody about the gospel, and the man began to, you know, talk about wanting to mess up with you, immediately you will shout, you will run out, you will begin to cry, you will publicize it, you will tell state leader, you will tell a Bible study leader. But now, abortion can go on without anybody knowing. State overseer did, does not know anything now that among those workers, and there, there is now abortion. The fear of God is no more there. You know, in the past, at least it's my own observation and experience, if people were living in sin, and we mistakenly gave them responsibility, I've had many cases that will come to me and say, Sir, I'm not qualified to be in that uh, place and to function as a preacher, as a Bible study at the retreat, because a backsliding, um, you know, praying my way through again. I'm not right with God. They will tell me. But now, you won't know. They won't tell you. They're looking for position and recognition here. And uh, you will give them responsibility, they will do it. They won't worry about whether they are backsliding or, or whatever. But in the past, it was not like that. We had the fear of God in our hearts. We are following the Lord. In a, with an a attitude of sobriety and fear. And there was humility. And there was respect for leadership. Respect for leadership. In, a, in this uh, deeper life, and uh, I've been here from the beginning, God used me to be the founder and to be the teacher. In most of the workers' retreats in those days, the one we did on the old road between Shagamo and Ibadan, you will know that I took all the messages myself in the earlier years because we had no other person. I was responsible in developing all the people, in teaching all the people, and therefore all the messages, all the Bible studies, everything in the workers' meeting, I will handle everything myself. Even in the general retreats, I did most of the things myself. And I looked into kitchen work, looked into things, and looked, looked into everything. Because it was a foundational work to make sure that things were very sound. And at that time, there was respect for leadership. And I could, you know, I could, you know just tell people, I could say, you uh, go to that place. You go to that place. I never had any rebellion. I mean, uh, Odi. Uh, was uh, in Lagos there uh, as my secretary, as my typist. I said, Augustine Odi, now uh, I'll get another typist, go to Cross River. And it didn't take me five minutes to tell him. Just told him, and then I went to Ghana. Before I came back from Ghana, he had obeyed what I said, he had gone. And, uh, you know, Shafe here was uh, my student at the university. He was also my student in the, you know, in the Word of God. And I said, uh, brother, we had a problem in Benue State. I said, when well, the workers retreat uh, in uh, June 1984, and I said, uh, brother Shafe, uh, today, uh, Saturday, at the end of that uh, retreat, I said, tomorrow at the Sunday service, you must be there and uh, take the meeting and tell the person over there that is having the problem that this is the, prob this the way I've solved the problem and then I will I'll see you later. It went that very day. Didn't take us uh, years. Uh, you know, as the founder, as the leader, I tell somebody something and then he will say, I am still praying. So I didn't pray before I told you. You know God more than me. I taught you the way of salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism. And after teaching you all that, I now tell you, now arise and go and do this. You are still going to pray about it. So I'm not, I don't know the Lord anymore. We were at a retreat in 1980 at, uh, at Ibadan. 
and uh, Lawon from uh, Quara State at that time. He had applied to come to, to become a student at the IBTC. And I just, uh, you know, had seen his form here at the IBTC, wanting to come and become a student when we're going to open the IBTC. And I just gave him a Bible study to handle at the retreat. And uh, when he taught the Bible study, the Spirit of God ministered within me and said, this person doesn't need to come to IBT. I called him, I said, you will be at Ibadan here and be in charge of your state. Didn't take me 10 minutes to do that. He was working at uh, at Ilori, at uh, Inquara, and he'll be coming to handle the Bible study. Eventually, it became settled in Oyo State. Oh, we didn't have any problem. It was very easy. When the teaching of the Word of God is sound, there is no problem in telling you, go and do this, and go and do this, and go and do that. But to not, today, now, if you tell somebody, go to that place, go to that place, they will be thinking, uh, you know, what they are going to get, what they are going to gain, deep lie. What did you turn this sin into? When did Satan come into you? I introduced Jesus to you. I never introduced Satan to you. I never introduced rebellion to you. All that I taught you was obedience to the word of God. And there was obedience to leadership in the earlier years of deeper life. There was uncompromising stand in all the offices, in all the families, everywhere. Now people knew. Anytime you asked anything, I said, the life member should give bribe. He said, never. I'm a Christian. I'll never do it. And you begin to preach immediately. Is it like that today? No. And there was moderation in everything. In dressing, physical appearance, this false doctrine of building a good image. I know one of the people that brought it into deeper life. Good image, good image, good image. And I've spoken to him. I've spoken to other people too. But it's getting them a long time to remove what they introduced. I didn't introduce that when we started. Good image, good dressing, good appearance, good days, good days. Good for the world, not good enough for heaven. All these things, you remove it. If we're going to go back to where deeper life was originally and to the vision that we had, we have to reorganize and readjust all these things. We are the love of the Bible. And we were addicted to Bible study. Now, if you know deeper life in the earlier years, our Bible study attracted more people than any other program. Am I right? Today, it, it attracts the least number of people. They are there on Sunday. They are there for miracle on Friday or Thursday, whichever day you have it in your state. On Monday or Tuesday for Bible study. You don't find out for the people there. Because they love and the addiction to the study of the Bible is no more there. You know, in the past we bore persecution and problems with joy. Somebody has married and it's not got a child, you never see it on his face. Just keeps on doing evangelism, preaching the gospel, going on crusade, doing everything that we need to do for the Lord. It's today, if somebody has a problem, he's not got a child, he can, if you call him and you say, lead us, you know, I cannot lead us fellowship. What am I going to tell them? I don't have child yet. And if I don't have child, how can I be leading us fellowship? You have salvation, you can't lead us fellowship. You have sanctification. That sanctification is not better. It's not more than the child. You have Holy Ghost baptism. That one is not more than the child. No, I've got salvation, but because I don't have child, I cannot do anything for God. I'm being persecuted, and I know what I'm facing in the family. Because of that, I cannot do anything for the Lord now. Well, in the past, we had the bearing, the endurance of persecution and opposition and problem, Without any problem, you know, with joy, with happiness, we'll talk about it and we'll say, I'm being persecuted. I'm suffering for the gospel. I'm suffering for the Lord. And I'll be laughing about it. And in the past, we had contentment, real contentment. We're satisfied with whatever we had. We wouldn't steal church money. We will not steal office money. We're not going to make all our prayers. In the past, we didn't make all our prayer requests to be promotion, promotion, promotion. Today, what's the prayer request? Look at all the prayer requests. 
They never pray, oh God, I'm praying and the church should help me pray. I want to become an evangelist. I want to become a missionary. I want to become a pastor. I want to be faithful to the Lord. I want to preach the gospel. I want to be on fire for the Lord. Those prayer requests are minimal. What kind of prayer requests do we see? That God will prosper my job. That God will give me enough money. That God will give me this and give me that. But it's because of going astray, backsliding. And we had equality among believers. I've spoken about that before. We had equality between the rich and the poor. And the rich were not our lords. Neither were the poor our lords. There was equality in the church between the rich and the poor. It is today that you will find that some preachers, unfortunate, in deeper life, will be telling their audiences, they will be saying, the local language does not have dictionary or concordance. Therefore, we cannot reckon with you know, local language. We cannot reckon with illiteracy. We cannot reckon with... You. If you don't know book, you cannot make progress here. If you don't know... We never in deeper life before. All the people we got... I mean, we got people that didn't even finish primary school, but they can read the Bible. That's enough. And they can pray. And they loved the Lord. And they really did things in this ministry. They were really useful. But it's today that you just put all the educated people there, the rich people there, telling them that, you know, uneducated people, they, they have no place, they have nothing they can do, because, uh, you know, after all, there is no concordance, there is no dictionary. Did I teach you that before you left Lagos? Did you get that from me? And if you are talking about education, are you more educated than I am? I'm educated. And I studied one of the most difficult subjects at the university. And I wasn't a dense person. I made a first class. But when I became the leader, the founder in deeper life, I put that, I threw that into the dustbin. I don't carry all that about. And I became, you know, a friend and a leader of the uneducated people and the illiterate and the poor people. As you see me dressing when we started this deeper life, did I dress like a university lecturer? You know how university lecturers dress? Did I dress like somebody and in big salary? When money was real money, was valuable in this country. And when, you know, the lecturers were still being paid, you know, being paid well. And when they were sending us abroad and I'll be getting, they'll be paying me salary here and paying me overseas as well. When I went for, you know, a, a particular kind of exchange program, you know, the money was there. You never saw it on me. You never saw it in my dressing. The vehicle I had, I sent it to Ghana for them to sell that vehicle and be able to, uh, you know, go along with the preaching of the gospel. Now that's not the foundation I laid. Did I move about as, you know, a big man, a, you know, a rich man, a lecturer, educated people? Did I show any disrespect for uneducated people, for poor people? Shouldn't you follow my example? Shouldn't you know that if you are a pastor, you have a pastor here who has been teaching you and leading you and we, we bring deeper life to where deeper life ought to be, where we re-establish the equality between the rich and the poor, the equality between the men and the women, and the equality between the illiterate and the educated. We had a very high standard of prerequisite before you could become a, become a worker. You know, today, you have a People that say they are workers, and when you begin to make some investigations, they are familiar spirit workers. Today, you have people that will say they are workers. When you begin to make investigation, they are messing up with their maid in the house. Workers. In the past, oh, such people it will take them time. But you know, today there's lobbying. You know what they call lobbying? If you discipline a fellow. If you say, this is not right, this is not right, you discipline him, people will be lobbying. You know, they will be coming to you. They will be saying, brother, so and so. Anytime they are coming to give testimony, you know, they will find a way of bringing the name of that person under discipline to the testimony. So that, you know, you can change your mind. And, you know, okay, if, uh, since they are giving the testimonies, everybody wants him. And if he's not there, they are not going to continue the church. Okay, 
You want to preach and be used like a tin of sardine. We eat the sardine in you and throw you away. If you want, go there and do it. That's what you want to do. But in the past, it wasn't like that. Because we really had an eye on a high standard. And people who have been in the church for five years, who, are, who have really been studying the word of God, living right, any day when you receive a letter that you are invited to Lagos to become, to attend the workers, National Workers Retreat, your, your greatest prayer has been answered. And you'll be coming before the time of that workers retreat, you would have been here. But today, not like that. The people that they are begging, they're saying, this uh, Congress will help you. It's a real, okay, if you cannot be there for the whole period. Can you not come for one or two days? It wasn't like that in the past. And if deeper life is like this when I'm still alive, what will happen if Jesus tarries and I'm no more here? Look at what you have made this whole thing to become. And in the past, there was clear, definite, observable difference between deeper life and all the denominations. There was transparent dealings in all our relationships. There were no white lies. Methodical, methodical cover-ups, ill-motivated gifts. You find people now that they give gifts. In deeper life, I never remember in the earlier years getting a piece of orange from anybody. Never. I mean, if you're going to be able to stand on the word of God, if you're getting, if you're sucking their orange and you're eating their rice and, you know, they're taking Maltex and uh, whatever it is uh, to your house, when they commit sin, you are not going to be able to do anything. Their rights will silence you. You know, ask all the people here, those who are state overseers now, a lot of them had not got married before they came to deeper life. Did I attend their wedding? Did I drink a Maltex in their wedding? Did I take Fanta from them? Ask all the people that are here, all the workers, do I take anything from anybody? Never. The people that bring them, I say, ah, hold it. Let me, let me have freedom. Because gifts will blind your eyes. But you know, today, you have all this, uh, eh, pastor, have this one. Eh, Bible study leader, have this one. Coordinator, have this one. Zona leader, have this one. This one, have this one. We well, were giving things to people in the earlier years, but the way we did it is that we'll put the gifts in an envelope, or put the gifts somewhere, wrap it up, and then uh, write your name there and put it in the offering box. And you will not know who gave it, but you know, today, you know the people that give it. They'll say, did you receive the shirt I sent to you? Uh-huh, it's me. Th that's the shirt you are wearing now. You, that's, my, that's the gift coming from me. We're buying them over. It wasn't like that in the earlier years. All this exchange of gifts and something. All these businessmen with all their bribes and all their corruption. With all the kickbacks that they are giving. They will come to pastor and say, ah, pastor, you know, we love you. I've been thinking about you. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure you are praying for me and God is prospering me. Uh, have this uh, 1,000 naira check. It's not for church, oh, it's for you in particular. You are the people that are destroying the church. You are destroying them with your 1,000 naira. And when you sin now, in fact, you are still living in sin, and you are telling them to pray for you, they have, you have diverted their ministry. Keep your money. All we want from you is obedience to the word of God. If you give us money, and yet you are not living right, you are destroying our lives. We give our whole life, our whole time, to the whole thing, and yet you are not obeying the word of God. And you are sending money, sending gifts, all we need from you is that you will obey the word of God. And there was clear, straightforward, convicting preaching in the earlier years. And you know the kind of preaching we gave in the early years. We gave examples. We gave illustrations. And we will so preach that the sinner will never be able to get out of the net. 
And we have testimonies in Lagos there. They will say when they came into the meeting and uh, the pastor was preaching, it was like he knew them before and all their lives were x rayed And they will get on their knees, on their faces, they will pray, they will cry, they will weep before the Lord. That was the kind of preaching we had in the past. Our songs had meaning and ministry. The songs that we sang in, the ye in years gone by, the songs we sang in the fellowship, they had meaning and they had ministry. Not worldly, black, American, soulish, sentimental song. Rock music, never. Not in deeper life in those days. But you know what is happening now? You know what the people are doing? I can give you state, 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 and, and, and state that are doing all these things. And, you know, they have this kind of music, they have this kind of thing. And by the time you really finish all that music and you come to preach the word of God, what kind of preaching are you even talking about? It's a kind of sentimental, motivational uh, kind of message that is making everybody happy. And the pastor is a jolly good fellow and is never able to strike at sin. But it wasn't like that in the past. Or are impartial in our discipline of sin without favoritism. Or are impartial. Anywhere we saw a necessity of rebuking anybody, we go straight ahead and we do it. And you know I've always done that. I've always done that. In workers' retreats, I'll, I'll stand the person up and say, you know, this is what he has done. In, uh, you know, meetings like June 1982, and we're over there, the small building over there. We came to have something like a strategy planning meeting. And uh, somebody had done what was wrong. That time, uh, state overseer. And I made him to stand up and tell the whole house what he had done. And after he had told them, then I came over there and I knocked that scene. You know, I have, I have always been strict. And I've not changed by the grace of God. Because uh, I don't know when the Lord will come. And it will be just when you change a little, uh, then the trumpet will sound. And Paul the Apostle said, he's looking for that price and pressing on so that he will be counted worthy on that day. He said, not that I've got it already, but I'm pressing on, pressing on. And he said, I put this my body on there. Lest after preaching to other people, I become a cast away. Our lives and lips were controlled. You know, deeper life, uh, we counted being a talkative sin. Those early years. You remember? Danger in a little member. Well, it's attract. Some of you don't even know. Help me wake up that person sleeping in the front row. Now, in the early years, the danger in a little member, we knew that being a talkative was a terrible thing. It was a terrible sin. And you cannot even say that we are born again if you are still a talkative. Today, there are people who say they are saved, they are sanctified, they are baptized in the Holy Ghost. And they exaggerate, they tell white lies, they, they talk, talk, and talk without end. You know, in the early years, you don't find people blowing their personal trumpets. You will know that in our meetings and retreats, we didn't allow people to come and take photographs of the preacher, take photographs of the congregation, take photographs of, you know, this and that. The head usher in Lagos at Bagada was telling me last night, I mean, in Lagos here, we, we still keep this scene, you know, uniform. And we still keep it as it was. And uh, everything that is going on here, I wasn't there last night, I was here. And the other people preach there, but I have to be informed because they, in Lagos, they don't make me a figurehead. They know that I'm a leader, and I'm their pastor, and I'm their father in the Lord. And they come to tell me everything that they know that I ought to know about. And he was telling me last night, the head usher, that some uh, uh, foreigners, uh, you know, from the America and other places, they came, and they saw the big crowd, and they wanted to take photographs. Immediately, our ushers went there and said, no. Come and see the head usher. And then they saw the head usher, and the head usher said, Our pastor is not around. That the person preaching is one of his uh, leaders, the leaders that, you know, are working under him. And without his permission, you cannot take the photograph of Bagada. 
You want to go and use it for publicity. You love us. You want to use our name and all that. And you want to get all that crowd and publicize all over the world. We appreciate your intention. But our pastor is not here to give you permission. And therefore you cannot do it. And they couldn't do it. And it was to fly off yesterday, uh, you know, back to their country, back to their nation. And they went without the photograph. You know, in Lagos, we are still, we're still doing what we ought to do. The photographs will allow our photographs we want to use for testimony. So that the testimony will be uh, a testimony that people know that it's not fiction. It's not fake story. But what do we find now? Hanging certificates at the wall. Hanging the marriage certificate on the wall. Hanging that photograph and that photograph. And when you come to the uh, house of... Uh, you know, state overseer now, he'll bring out the album of his great activities when he went on mission field, when he was counseling somebody, when he was, you know, teaching, when he was praying for the sick, what he did on the mission field. I don't have any album like that. And I have gone to many places. Why? Well, because I have conviction. A lot of these people have lost conviction. But in the early years there was no blowing of personal trumpet and we feared god we feared sin we feared hell when are we going to go back to this old path that we have been talking about look at jeremiah chapter 7 jeremiah chapter 7 Verse 3, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. The condition of your remaining in the kingdom of God is that you will amend your ways. You will come back to the old path, stand in the ways, and see, and ask for the old path. Where is the good way? And walk ye in it. Only then will you find rest to your soul. You've seen where you've gone astray. You've seen where you are backslidden in particular. You have seen where you have changed the standard. You have seen where your convictions have changed. And it is necessary that according to the word of God, you will amend your ways and you will need the grace of God. You will need cleansing. Of the blood of Jesus Christ. I want you to rise up now. It's not time to. You know be going running to the toilet. The people that uh, hear the message. And after the message they run to the toilet. A lot of them are this kind of. Uh, witch and wizard people. That they never really are able to pray through. And get their lives settled. Do not be the one that is troubling Israel. Trying the standard. This is not the time to. Uh, be meditating and thinking or writing this is the time to arise and pray and amend your ways let's come back to the old path you know you've lost your relationship with god you've lost salvation call upon the lord and be born again you know there is sin in your life you know there is lying you know there is adultery you know you are covering up stealing get back to the Lord and be restored and be born again you know that you are messing up with other people's wives you know pride has come in you know that worldliness has come in you know you do not have the fear of God in your heart anymore you know you are not living a transparent life you know that you are becoming corrigible then call upon the name of the Lord, repent and be born again. Disobedience to the word of God is a sin. And rebellion against leadership is a sin. You know you are a backslider because of your rebellion, because of your disobedience. You have to repent and call upon the name of the Lord so that you can be born again. Restored into the fold, into fellowship with God again. Are you the one that troubles Israel? Are you the one that is corrupting this church? 
Are you the one that is bringing worldliness into the body of Christ? Are you the one that is introducing adultery, fornication, abortion, immorality into the midst of the saints of God? Are you the Jezebel? Are you the Jezebel? Are you the Jezebel that is destroying Israel? Are you the Ahab, the leader, the overseer? The pastor that is destroying this church with your compromise? Are you the one that loves money more than God? More than the church? More than the ministry? And all you are looking for now is gift, money, good things, material things. Let's come back to the old past. Let's come back to the old past. Let's make all the necessary confessions, all the necessary repentance, all the necessary restitution. Remove all this politics away from the church. Remove all this worldliness away from the church. Remove all this compromise away from the church. Remember where we were in the early years? Let's come back. Remember the old path? Let's come back. Remember the fear we had for God? Let's come back. Remember we hated sin? Let's come back. Don't be a prodigal son. Don't be a stumbling block in the church of God. Don't be reprobate silver in the church of God. Don't be the Achan in the church of God. Prepare for the coming of the Lord. Let's bring this church back to where it was. Let's bring this church back to the standard of the word of God. We have the hope, we are the hope of this nation. Let's keep the fire burning. We are the hope of this nation. Let's lift the standard up high. 